asked uh, adequately already. How the future of Iceland and is Iceland going to be a major spiritual center and so on. So we are going to talk about that uh, probably before the question and answer period. Yes, we do pick up telepathic thought forms in the room. So some of your questions will be answered before you ask them. Or you may have a question and all of a sudden we start talking about it without you opening your mouth. And that's fine. All of you are telepathic as well, so we have no special claim. So let's begin with the basic material that we feel is absolutely essential in order for you to create the, the beautiful golden age of peace and prosperity on earth that you've been promised in, by many of your teachers. And some of them even gave you a good formula for how to achieve that. But for various reasons, souls on earth did not listen or they fell back into old patterns. We're going to talk briefly about why that is. Why your civilizations have risen only to fall again. And even now, the Western world is on the brink of collapse. You don't have to be psychic to figure that out. <laughs> and the Eastern world, to some extent also, perhaps not so spectacularly as the West. Why? Uh, even the Hopi prophesized the fifth world rising from the ashes of the fourth, which is the one you're in now. So why do, do civilizations rise and fall? In the written materials, we cover the basics of Pangaea, Lemuria, Atlantis, and the present as being the four worlds that the Hopi speak of in their prophecy. There have been other relatively minor civilizations that have come and go, such as Egypt, Greece, Rome, uh, Old England, etc. And uh, so this pattern has been going on for a very long time. Why? There are explanations given in the written materials. We're going to go into them just a little bit tonight. Not all of you have read the books. And we're going to go into a lot of information that's not in the books as well. We like what we would call state-of-the-art information, up-to-the-minute information. We don't just go back and repeat old truths and, and call it an evening. You can just read the books and stay home if you want that. So, original cause or original sin, as it's called in Christianity, and it's called the separation in some teachings. What is that all about? Because that's the root cause of all misery and suffering on the earth. Let's just say a couple words about the belief in separation from God. First of all, it's entirely false. There's no truth whatsoever to that belief. And yet that belief is the cause of all pain and suffering in this world. You can Take that as like the roots of the tree of fear, the roots of the tree of guilt and judgment, the roots of illusion are based in that idea. There are not very many things in life that are impossible, but it's impossible to actually be separate from God. Our view of God is that God is all that is. So how can you be separate from everything? By definition, everything is everything. Nothing is everything, everything is nothing. Words start to fail once you go to the ultimate level of awareness. But how can there be a force that opposes God if God is everything? That's like the fingers on the hand. Imagine there's 7.4 billion fingers on this, the body of humanity, or the body of God. Wouldn't it be crazy if this finger was at war with this finger? They're fighting each other. Obviously, that, that's an insane idea. So, if all of you are fingers on the body of God, then there's only one being in this room expressing itself as individual souls. <coughs> Just because you're individual souls does not mean you are separate. Just because your physical body, this body seems to end here and that body seems to begin over there, 
doesn't mean you're separate. And your science has proven this. Some of you are familiar with the non-locality principle of quantum physics and its uh, specific aspect, the entanglement principle. Basically, if you look at that principle, it states that everything is interconnected, everything is interrelated. And if you follow that principle to its logical conclusion, you recognize there is only one point in the universe, and everything is a holographic projection of that one point. And that one point exists within each one of you, as you, and there is no separation whatsoever between that point in this body and that point in that body. It is the exact same point. The philosophers came up with the same idea. <coughs> you have one philosopher, he says the name is J. Krishnamurti, who came up with this idea, the observer is the observed. So think about that for a moment. What are the implications of that? The observer is the observed. What does that mean? In quantum physics, there's no such thing as an independent experiment. You can put 10 meters of lead walls between you and the experiment, and your consciousness still affects the experiment. By the way, it happens instantaneously, not at the speed of light. Now, non-locality means both time and space exist in the eternal now, in this point, in this moment. So whether you're going through time or through space, everything is now. And if you change something on this side of the universe, it registers instantaneously on the other side of the universe. Not millions of years later, because it takes time, uh, it takes um, light that long to travel from one point to another. No, that's only true in a limited realm. So, philosophers say the observer is the observed, the thinker is the thought. There's lots of corollaries to that. So basically, one of the scientists says, there's no out there, out there. There's actually no inner and outer reality. There's simply reality. We say there's an inner and outer, really. So where is the inner self located? If you cut open the brain, can you find it? Maybe it's in the arms or the feet. Where's the inner self? You're not going to find it. Even if you cut away three-fourths of the brain, there are certain functions that are still available to the individual soul whose brain has been cut away. How can that be? How can they function with three-quarters of their brain missing? Well, because the brain is not the source of knowledge and information. It is merely a relay station, like those old-fashioned telephone switchboards where the operator is sitting there plugging phone lines in to one another. That's the brain. And even though the brain is merely a relay station, it has almost infinite capacity. This is review for many of you, but the number of possible paths through which information can flow in one human brain is so large a number, it cannot be expressed longhand. It has to be expressed using exponents and logarithms. Uh, 10 log 10 to the 98th power, or 10 to the 10 to the 98th power, approximately. That number is so large that if you tried to write it out longhand, the, one, the zeros after the one notebook-sized paper would stretch around the Earth seven times, and it would take 250,000 years to write the number out longhand. That's the number of possible paths through which information can flow in one human brain. If you looked at nature, you can see that nature doesn't make junk. Everything has a purpose in nature, including the so-called junk DNA in the human brain. So, how in the world does that explain our limited perception, your limited perception as human beings, if you have all this vast, nearly infinite capacity, 
Why? If you're only using like 5 or 10% of your brain, you're not even using that much of your capacity. Those are just the fixed neuronic circuits, the synapses, etc. that you might be using 5% of, of the actual hardwiring of the human brain. This isn't even talking about the potential capacity. So, obviously, who you are is much, much greater than what you've been taught by so-called mainstream science. So, there's, there's proof, in other words, to the things we're saying. And there's only a few of you that perhaps come from a scientific background and really need that scientific proof, but it's available. So, that's why we mention it. Uh, we don't like to just ask you to take our word for it that God is infinite love and compassion. Find out. So, recognizing that what you've been taught is a lie. You are not miserable, helpless, powerless little creatures living on a planet with a power elite that controls your every move and spies on your computers and your <coughs> social media. And, okay, so that's true on one level. But does that mean that you must be subject to that? And that brings us to another important point, the whole idea of power. From a scientific point of view, power means potential or kinetic energy. That means you have the capacity to do something or you're actively doing it. Kinetic energy is actively doing it. Potential energy is having the potential to do it. So yeah, basic, basic science here. You have what you call a power elite on this planet. Those are the souls who think they are in control of this planet. And as long as there are souls who believe they are in control of this planet, they will seem to be in control of this planet. It's an illusion. In fact, if you were truly powerful, you would have absolutely no need to try and control and manipulate others to achieve whatever your purposes are. True power does not need to control anyone or anything. And so these beings that seem to be in power are like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. A little man with a megaphone pretending to be the almighty, all terrible Wizard of Oz. So do not believe for one minute that the so-called power elite are powerful. They are overcompensating for their belief in powerlessness by seeming to need billions and billions of dollars or euros or British pounds or whatever, by seeming to need military might in order to control their interests on the planet. And yes, the same souls control both sides of all the major wars. You can read about this in history books. Uh, there's many war historians who meticulously researched all of the major wars on planet Earth, and they have determined that the same souls are financing both sides of the wars, controlling the governments like little puppet strings. So yes, you've heard this, that governments are merely puppets. It's true, based on your definition of puppets. So therefore, why? <coughs> And the why has to do with the idea of separation. That if you believe you're separate from God, then you inevitably believe there is a force outside of yourself that can oppose your will or God's will, which really are one and the same, but they seem to be different. There's really no such thing as human will versus God's will. There's only God's will, if you want to think of it that way. But there is this idea of separation, which you call the human ego, which believes it is separate from the whole, so it creates an elaborate system of defenses designed to keep the ego's belief in itself going. It's all designed to keep that belief in separation going. So all of these so-called power elites, dark Illuminati, dark extraterrestrials, reptilians, whatever you want to call them, doesn't matter what costume they're wearing, it's still a costume in the costume drama called Life on Earth. 
And underneath the costume is a little man with a megaphone who's scared, who feels powerless and helpless, and thinks the only way he can, he can overcome that belief in littleness is to put on a big bravado, a big ego, a big arrogance. And in some cases, it takes the form of a two-year-old in an adult body. That's the expression he uses to describe some of the tyrants, heavy tyrants of the world who try to suppress their people, dictators, whatever name you want to give to them. And you've had your share in this part of the world, although Iceland is a little bit isolated from some of the drama taking place in Western Europe and the Americas and Asia, etc. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's just be real clear about what do you do about this sense of powerlessness. There are specific steps, and we're going to go over them right now. Step number one is to acknowledge the problem, to be in complete acceptance of what the problem is. That means coming out of denial. <coughs> that means, well, you know, in the Alcoholics Anonymous program, the first step is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Well, that's, that's a, an intermediate step because ultimately you're not powerless <coughs> over anything. But you believe you are, and beliefs are very powerful. So if you believe that you are powerless against the dark Illuminati or the power elite or the bankers or whoever, then you're going to have that experience because of your belief. So the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that you have that belief, that you are powerless or relatively powerless. Maybe you believe you can control a few things in your immediate life like how much money you spend at the grocery store, supermarket, or things like that. So, but that's, that's a tiny, tiny little piece of who you are. So, start with where you are. The most basic step, start where you are. You might think, well, that's so obvious, why even mention it? But so many souls on earth are in denial about where they are. So, you know, if you wanted to get to Greenland from Iceland, you have to acknowledge that you're in Iceland. Because if you think you're in Greenland, you'll end up in Canada. <laughs> you know, or the other way around. But you know what I mean. So you have to start where you are. And then you say, okay, this is where I am and this is where I want to go. I'm in Iceland, I want to get to Greenland. I'm not in Greenland, ending up in Canada. So Step number one is to acknowledge that you have this belief in separation which seems to be controlling 99.99% of your life. And maybe every once in a while, the 0.01%, uh, which is your knowing that you are not separate from God, kicks in and for just a moment you have what he calls a satori experience or a temporary enlightenment. And for just a moment you get a glimpse of what's <coughs> the illusion of separation. So start with, okay, the mass hypnotism on planet Earth is we're all separate beings, separate from each other, struggling to survive, uh, spending trillions of dollars on military weapons instead of education and feeding people, etc. All comes from that belief. So you start there, and then you acknowledge the real truth that you have, that's been proven to you by science and by teachers throughout history, which is that you are powerful, creative, spiritual beings created in the image and likeness of your creator. Genesis chapter 1 of the Christian Bible, created in the image and likeness of God. So what does that mean? Well, if God is all-powerful, then what does that make you if you're created in the image and likeness? You're all-powerful. First chapter of the Christian holy book. And it's in the Bhagavad Gita, it's in the Quran, it's in all of the holy books in one form or another. Of course, there's a lot of distortion in those books, 
bad translations, intentional mistranslations, etc. So you have to pick out the truth from the illusion if you study scriptures or sacred books or things like that. So, acknowledge that you have believed in separation for a very long time and acknowledge it's an illusion, proven scientifically to be an illusion, and that who you are is this vast, creative, intelligent, spiritual being connected to everything in the universe, and in fact, you are the universe. Perhaps you've heard of a scientist named Nassim Harriman. Uh, he came up with <coughs> definitive proof that the entire universe exists within a single proton. That's pretty intense. How many protons do you have in your physical form? Maybe a hundred trillion. So you have a hundred trillion originals, not copies, originals of the entire universe within this physical form that you are wearing. Then you have that nearly inconceivable number of interconnections in the human brain. So you acknowledge the truth about who you are, a powerful and limited spiritual being. So you started with acknowledging that you have a belief in powerlessness, a belief in separation, and that who you really are is beyond that belief. And so there's your two starting places. Then what do you do? Because that's still not enough. <laughs> you think, golly, you mean there's more? Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to become aware of all of the ways that the illusion is reinforced. <coughs> Look at advertising. Look at your economic system. Your economic system is almost the exact opposite of higher spiritual truths. You almost could not come up with something that's more opposite than your present economic system. In order to keep going economically, you have to have more and more people buying more and more things that they don't need, but you have to convince them that they need more and more things in order to be okay. Little Johnny's iPhone 6 just doesn't work anymore. He needs an iPhone 7, or he's just not cool. That's one example, of course. But look at advertising. Look at buy, 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 more, more, more. And the ego, the belief in separation, is never satisfied. Even if you get what you think you want, then what? After a while, you get bored with it, or it loses its luster, loses its appeal, and you need something more. This is the human condition, and it abbreviated a bit. So your whole economic system is based on the idea that you are inadequate, you are lacking, and therefore you need all these things in order to feel good about yourself. Better toothpaste, better deodorant, better hair color, better breasts, better whatever it is. Then I'll be loved, and then I'll be approved of if I have more, more, more. So the whole society is based on that. So you think, well, I know this, and I, I've transcended this, but have you? Because it goes deep and it goes subtle. Every day, look at your thoughts, look at your feelings. In what way am I perpetuating the belief in separation? This is what you say to yourself. In what way are my thoughts and feelings perpetuating the illusion of separation? What did I think or feel today that's coming from a belief in inadequacy, a belief in lack, a belief in limitation? Well, I can't quit my job even though I hate it because I won't be able to pay my bills. There's a favorite. Uh, I can't leave my husband's <coughs> wife even though they abuse me or treat me like dirt because I'll be all alone. I won't know what to do with myself, etc. So, sorry if we touched a few of your favorites, <laughs> those two. So, what do you do? You beat yourself up and say, oh, I guess I'm a miserable loser because. I know I can't stand my mates, but I'm afraid to move out, and I can't stand my job, but I'm afraid to try and get another one, blah, blah, blah. So do you beat yourself up? No. That's going to perpetuate the problem. 
Beating yourself up means that you've identified with the little self with its problems, and now you hate your little self with its problems. So now you have conflict inside of yourself. You have a conflict between what is and what should be. Well, I should be in my power, in my center. I should be loving everyone, but I can't stand my neighbor, and I have fantasies of strangling him with a rope every night before I go to sleep, and I'm coveting my neighbor's wife, and blah, blah, blah. So what do you do? You have to go back and acknowledge where you are. I am stuck in separation, but I know it's an illusion, and I am now committed to remembering who I am, a powerful, creative, spiritual being, and <coughs> I'm going to start eliminating the distractions. That's step number three. Step number one, acknowledge and love and accept yourself exactly as you are. Step number two, acknowledge who you really are. And step number three, start eliminating distractions. That probably means turning off the television. Some of you have, have already freed yourself from the tube. And maybe you only watch Netflix or you know a movie or something like that on your television set if you have one. Start eliminating the environmental suggestions that you are not good enough. Sometimes that means saying goodbye to family members or only seeing them once in a while. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you're bad and guilty because you didn't go to the family reunion. It means you value yourself enough to say no to the dysfunctions in your family. When you go to your relatives and they, can, they talk to you nonstop about what a loser you are for believing in that spiritual mumbo-jumbo or psychic healing or holistic <laughs> healing or uh, crystals or whatever it is. And so you get constant barrage of negativity when you go to certain family members, some of you. <clears throat> so what do you do? You have to start eliminating the distractions. You have to start protecting yourself psychically from negative people. Some of you have a job, <clears throat> and you go to your job, and there's negative people at your job. Yeah, some of you, that's true. Maybe you even have a negative boss if you're not the boss yourself. <laughs> and if you are the boss, you probably have negative employees. <laughs> but if you're the owner of the business, you may have negative clients and customers who are always complaining about their products and services. Maybe. <clears throat> so you can't get away from people's complaining and whining and moaning and groaning, but you can protect yourself using various techniques, some of which are taught in the channel's workshops, and some of which you can find other places with other teachers. He's going to go over some of how to raise your vibration during the workshops. Uh, we have a short version <clears throat> tonight, and, and Step number one, we're going to tell you tonight. Stay away from negative people as much as you can. Build a support system of positive people around you. Some of you are doing this and you know how valuable it is. Or the channel stroke. There's a network of people right here in this room. <clears throat> Spend time with each other. Go to events together. Go to yoga classes. Go to meditation classes. You know, go to retreats. Go to workshops like the one this channel is leading. Spend time with positive people. Not people who are in denial about their negativity. Every one of you in this room has negative thoughts and feelings at some point. It's not that you get rid of your little human self. It's that you expand your awareness to include more of who you are. This is what transcendence means. It doesn't mean denying or escaping from your humanity. If this is your humanity, and this is who you are, it means identifying with your big self, your powerful creative self. And 
To do that, you need help. Because this planet is immersed in negativity. Three out of four thought forms floating through this room right now from humanity at large is negative. Worry, anxiety, fear, anger, sadness, guilt, judgment. And only one-fourth are positive, constructive thoughts. Love, caring, compassion. So if you do nothing, you start to get pulled down what's called the default. This is a different use of default and not paying back your loans. This is default, meaning what happens if you do nothing. So you have to do something every day to not only keep your vibration up, but to raise your vibration. And the number one method is hanging out with people who are on a spiritual path, who are dedicated and committed to helping themselves and helping others, which would be you in this room. So these gatherings are not just about getting more information from various teachers. They're about true networking, which is not about selling a certain number of products, but it's about sharing your experiences with each other. Some of you are going through what this channel might call ascension symptoms, and you feel all alone, like I have nobody to talk to, my doctor doesn't understand, can't find anything wrong with me. My family doesn't understand, thinks I've gone crazy. My coworkers don't understand, they think I'm hallucinating. But you get together in a room like this and someone else shares that they have the same thing going on. Oh, I'm not alone, I'm not going crazy. Or if I am going crazy, at least I have company. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the number one practical step. We didn't say easy step. We know some of you are saying, but my family's negative, my coworkers are negative, I don't know anybody who's positive. Yeah, it's not easy. You have to, anything in life, you have to make an effort. You have to reach out to people that you feel a connection with, that you know are on a spiritual path. Maybe do a Reiki trade with someone, or a massage trade, or whatever you do. Uh, but do something every day, whether it's meditation in the morning, whether it's talking to a spiritual friend at night. Uh, go to a sacred place. There's many of them here in Iceland. Go to one of your favorite places to meditate. Um, so you need that reinforcement because the negative program, as you know, is very, very strong on this planet. Call on us. Call on your spirit guides, call on the ascended masters, call on the various helpers that are assisting this planet. There are millions of helpers assisting this planet. We come through just a few channels, but you can call on us directly. You don't need this channel to access our knowledge and information. You can download a portion of our teachings directly simply by asking. It's not easy to, to receive because of the static, which you call the frequency fence or frequency barrier surrounding the earth, which is growing weaker by the day. Within the next 20 to 30 years, we anticipate the frequency barrier will be completely dismantled. It's been here for your protection and also for your enslavement, depending on who's doing what. Now that you know who you are, you know that it's impossible to become enslaved unless you believe you can be enslaved. So it's time to do whatever is necessary to reinforce the knowledge of who you really are. Coming tonight, being reminded over and over by this channel and by our group that you are magnificent beings, we cannot actually remind you often enough. But if we just got up here and repeated you are beautiful creative beings over and over, you'd probably leave because your ego would get bored and say, gosh, he just keeps saying the same thing over and over. This is boring. I want my money back. You know, whatever. So, it's time for questions, but let us answer the one that's 
There's at least 15 thought form forms floating around this room about Iceland and the future of Iceland. So let's answer that one first. This is a very special place. You're absolutely correct. It's not the only special place on the Earth. It's not necessarily the first place that's going to ascend. That's probably somewhere in Tibet or maybe the, the mountains of Peru or Bolivia. But it's definitely uh, ahead of the game, if you want to think of it as a game, because of its relatively isolated location. And yes, there are some ley lines which run through here. One of the branches of the ley line that runs through Giza and Jerusalem and then branches off into uh, <clears throat> Avebury and Stonehenge and Glastonbury, one of those ley lines does branch out across the northern Atlantic into Iceland. Another branch goes into parts of Scandinavia, yet another branch goes up into parts of northern Siberia and Russia. So you do have ley lines running through this island. You do have power spots on this island. Uh, he has already, in just two days here, uh, felt a much higher, clearer energy than in many of the places he's been recently. There's not so much of that cloudiness, that psychic cloudiness that exists in most parts of the world. There's some, of course. There's uh, one, of, one of the belief systems that he observed immediately upon arriving here. People are happier, but they still believe life is a struggle. Most Icelanders believe life is a struggle, but they tend to be generally happier than people from many of the cities he's been in. And so we're generalizing, of course. We don't speak for everyone, but there is Mostly it's because of the climate, generally cold climate. There's uh, a need to take care of the physical body a little bit more meticulously, perhaps, than in some of the warmer climates. But you also have a wonderful addition to this place, and that is geothermal energy, the water. He has already experienced the water in several different ways, and it is an absolute blessing. It is one of the if not the biggest natural blessing to Iceland is the water, uh, the geothermal energy, the uh, soaking in the hot baths, taking showers with this water. It's not loaded with chemicals like the water in most parts of the world. Uh, it, it's not the chemicals from pesticides have not leached into the soil nearly as much as they have in most of the world. So you have fewer pesticides, fewer toxins, and so these, these are definitely pluses. Um, in terms of politically and economically, your government, uh, in, in this channel's chart, falls into the uh, light to moderate levels of corruption. Uh, he has not found a government in all of his travels that has no corruption. Apparently, such does not exist on planet Earth in any of the major countries on planet Earth. But your government is a bit less corrupt than many of the governments on the planet. Your economic system, unfortunately, is tied to the Bank of England as well as many of the other central banks. And so you would need to find a way of creating a new currency if you wanted to be free of the economic cartel or banking cartel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so you can do that. You have the ability to be relatively self-sufficient. You can put in greenhouses. This is already starting to happen in many parts of Iceland. Uh, you can put in algae farms, uh, growing of kelp, uh, lots of sea vegetables that are very relatively unpolluted here. And you can even grow some fruits and vegetables in your greenhouses that are, that are heated by geothermal energy. Uh, it's, it's maybe, you've reached 10% of the potential for that source right now. Without destroying your environment, you can increase it about 10 times, the use of geothermal for growing fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot you can do to wean yourselves off the global economy, the, 
the city of London, Washington, D.C., Brussels, uh, the Vatican, Tel Aviv, all of these centers of the so-called dark Illuminati. You can wean yourselves off them if you come together and create a resonant field of positive energy. And in the workshops, uh, he'll talk more about how to become psychologically invisible to the so-called dark side. Notice we say so-called because it is an illusion. Darkness is an illusion, but it's a very persistent illusion, as Einstein would have called it. So, uh, Iceland is a special place. The light workers of Iceland are starting to come together more frequently. Uh, we go to cities of two million people and get crowds like this sometimes with good organization. So, here you have, what, 330,000 residents and three or four times that many tourists throughout the year, and yet, here you are. And this is only a percentage of the light workers, certainly they're not all in this room. So, yes, you have a glorious future in Iceland. And it's, is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. It's not going to be easy anywhere. You're going to have resistance in your government. You're going to have resistance in your banking system, in your some of your corporations uh, that are used to doing it the old way. Well, my father did it, and his father did it this way, and his father did it this way, and who are you to come and tell me I need to change the way I live? Give me another big beef steak, even though eating beef is destroying half the world's resources. I need a big steak on my plate. No offense to any of you who eat beef. If you do, we are not judging you. We're simply stating a fact that it uses a tremendous amount of resources. And there are people right here that giving up their beef steak is like pulling teeth. They don't want to do it. <laughs> so again, we're not judging people who eat beef. We're simply stating our observation of how it affects your environment. So. Let's go ahead with verbal questions. There's some more floating around we could ask, but we want you to participate. So please go ahead with verbal questions, uh, and uh, Stefan will, will call on you when you raise your hand, uh, if more than one of you raise your hand at the time. Yeah. Hey. Um, I'm Especially the, the main hospital, because uh, the government doesn't put enough money in the healthcare, so many uh, nurses are quitting the job in the hospital, and uh, so yeah, there's a lot of pressure in the hospital, and uh, my feeling is that uh, the healthcare is in a way. Uh, breaking down. I don't know if, if, if it's a good thing. So we can uh, start from, uh, from something new? Or? Well, yes, to some degree that's true. Healthcare is definitely a major problem worldwide. It's certainly not, not confined to Iceland. It's actually much worse in the, in the Americas, in parts of Asia even in parts of Western Europe. And there's a couple of problems. One is that healthcare is a big money-making uh, system for the pharmaceutical companies and major corporations. Uh, you are probably aware that there have been cures for cancer for just about as long as cancer has been an issue, and that the cures have been largely suppressed. The other factor is the stressful lifestyles that most human beings have, eating processed food, um, working at jobs they hate, the topic you brought up earlier. And um, so you have high stress, bad food, uh, a money-oriented health system, even in countries that <clears throat> supply basic health care, uh, single-payer systems and things like that. Somebody is still paying the bill, and somebody is still jacking the price up of the medications and the procedures in the hospitals. 
Um, in the Americas, uh, just the accommodation in the hospital runs two to three thousand dollars per night. You could stay at the Four Seasons Resort in the penthouse suite for that kind of money, perhaps, depending on what city you're in. So, uh, and then you get charged for every little thing, or your insurance company, or your government, or your health department gets charged for every little thing. Uh, a single pill that you could buy at the pharmacy for 35 cents, if the nurse administers it, it's $15, for example. So the cost of being sick is on multiple levels. Again, we're, we're on a human plane here. We're not looking at this from a higher perspective. So you have two problems. The money-making system that, that health, uh, that companies get rich off of sick people. And then you have the whole concept of sickness, which is based on an imbalance within your being. All illness is about imbalance on one or more of six basic levels that this channel has given in his materials. <clears throat> Just basically, for those of you who won't be here this weekend, <clears throat> they are the physical, emotional, mental, astral, etheric, and causal levels of being. Six levels that can go out of balance. And when one or more of those levels is out of balance, there is some degree of illness. It may be such a small degree of illness that you hardly notice it. But if someone brings it to your attention, you know, I just don't feel like I'm 100% alive. I feel like I'm just going through the motions of life. I'm not truly living. That's some of you in this room right now. And so you're, you have the absence of a full-blown influenza or hepatitis or whatever it is. But you're still ill, you're still not well, you're out of balance, your emotions are suppressed, maybe you were abused growing up and you haven't cleared all of the trauma, maybe you um, have had bad relationship after bad relationship and you can't seem to break out of the cycle, whatever it is, you're out of balance. And this is 99% of humanity has some type of imbalance in the six lower bodies. <clears throat> so this is one of the things this channel teaches in the workshops, is how to integrate the six lower bodies. Because if all of you is functioning together harmoniously, all of your levels are working together, you start to manifest your power. This is self-empowerment. When you end this internal conflict, that almost all of you have going on in some level of your being. We mentioned a couple of obvious examples. Staying in a job you hate or a marriage you can't stand. Those are just two examples. There's many, many more. Some of them are little. Conflict with your children. Uh, conflict with uh, your neighbors. Uh, you go to the grocery store and everything has junk in it. You can't find any help with it. Well, fortunately, We've seen a few places here that are uh, accommodating those of you who don't want me to jump through. So <clears throat> we went to one last night called GLOW, G-L-O. <clears throat> and it's based on the idea of glowing radiance from within. So there are some opportunities here to become more healthy. And you have the, the huge advantage that your land and soil are not heavily contaminated with pesticides. There's only a little bit of pesticide use in Iceland, not a lot. There's not very much agricultural land in Iceland where there probably would be more pesticides being used. So when it comes to health, uh, the best advice this channel has is don't get sick. And there are ways to avoid getting sick. And many of you are already aware of what those are since you started um, putting high quality, highly nutrient dense foods into your diet, many of you stop getting colds or influenza or your, your allergies <coughs> go away or whatever. And, uh, and you have one of the richest sources of health right here, which is kelp, seaweed, uh, and uh, certain algae, spirulina, chlorella. You can get them relatively easily here. And 
So start making use of the fact that your sea is less polluted here than it is further south. And uh, you know, start eating sea vegetables if you're not already eating them and things like that. So do what you can. Uh, this channel says always use multiple methods of getting well. Uh, if you think positive thoughts but you eat junk food, you're certainly better off than if you think negative thoughts and eat junk food. But why not think positive thoughts and eat healthy food? It makes more sense, doesn't it? And if you do end up in the hospital, uh, first of all, forgive the ignorant doctors and nurses that, that listen to everything the pharmaceutical companies say, so you have to forgive them. And if you can, try to educate them. Do your best. You may not succeed, but at least make an effort to educate them. Uh, if they give you pain medication and it has uh, codeine or cocaine or something else in it, um, just say, you know, I think I'll stick with the lesser evil, which might be uh, ibuprofen or something like that, which is far less damaging to the body than codeine. Uh, simple things like that. They're, they're just tiny steps. We're, we're talking going from here to here, and we're talking from here earlier. But it's still, start with the baby steps. Eliminate the narcotic drugs from your medicine cabinet and replace them with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And then eventually go away from those into things like oil of oregano, which is a an natural antibiotic, and so on. You know, learn about which herbs you can take to Try to eliminate as much as possible the synthetic drugs. Sometimes they're lifesavers. Penicillin has saved a lot of lives. Now people are becoming resistant to it because of abusing other pharmaceuticals. So we're not going to go into a long discussion about pharmaceutical drugs, but educate yourself. The internet is filled with wonderful um, information that liberate you from the vicious cycle of pharmaceutical drugs. The average person that's the age of this channel takes six medications per day. Six. Half of them are to counteract the side effects from the other half. Uh -huh. <laughs> so don't get started if you can possibly avoid it. You know, find natural alternatives before you get into an endless cycle pill popping. So we took a lot of extra time with your question, but it was a good one. We certainly didn't cover everything. It's a vast topic. So honor the fact that your body doesn't like rapid change. Do your best to accommodate your body's need for slow and gradual change. This channel travels a lot, goes from warm climates to cold climates, to populated to unpopulated. And so he has to be extra careful with his physical body because it's a lot of changes. So, back to your question. Dr. Israel, what are you doing? Yeah, so as many, many of us who are here are, like you say, light workers, uh, working for the sake of others, I was curious if you have some uh, simple and uh, extremely easy and fast way of clearing old traumas from this lifetime, from generations before, and past lifetimes. Yes, yes. This channel has a technique called timeline healing, which he uses in the private sessions sometimes. He also trains people on how to become timeline healers. Perhaps in the future trip we'll come here and teach that. Uh, it's a technique that combines the best of psychotherapy with past life regression, uh, soul retrieval, reframing, and a few other technologies. It was brought to him by his, his guides, the Arcturians, many years ago. And that's, uh, it, it, many of the, the uh, uh, students of this technique have described it as far more powerful than traditional psychotherapy. Uh, some of the students said, I was in therapy every week for six years, and after one time I'm healing session, I feel like I made more progress than I did in that six years of therapy. So, investigate it, see if it's right for you. 
And there's many other techniques as well, but, but uh, the, the gist of this technique is that you can, you can go back in time as well as go anywhere in space. The non-locality principle says basically there's only one point in the universe. And so you are everywhere present at once, through all time and space. So there are aspects of you that appear to be in the linear past or linear future. And you can access those parts of you right now. You might call them parallel selves <clears throat> or parallel lives. Uh, in linear time, they're past, present, or future lives. And you can access them and you can give healing to those aspects of yourself that are existing in the past or the future or in some other dimension or part of the universe. So little by little, as you grow and evolve and expand, you will be able to access those levels and dimensions of yourself that exist in other time frames, other than other locations. Uh, so that is a powerful technique. Uh, forgiveness is a very simple technique which erases karma. And if you forgive everyone in your life totally and completely, which is, which yes, you can do that, um, you'll be amazed at how much better you feel physically as well as emotionally. You may just stop getting certain illnesses. Your cancer might go into remission if you have cancer. Just from clearing your emotional body and forgiving <coughs> people in your life. You probably know if you've been into holistic health for any length of time at all that almost every disease arises from stuffing or repressing emotions as well as bad lifestyles and things like that. In fact, the emotional suppression is the number one cause of illness. Number one. By and far and away number one. Suppressing emotions, not finding adequate emotional expression. This channel was a rebirther for many years. It's a breathing yoga. And when you breathe properly, you move emotions through the body. They don't stay stuck where they fester and boil and cause illness. It's just a simple thing like breathing adequately. You'll find that the, the simplest things in life are often the most powerful. Of course, there's not a lot of money to be made if it's as simple as breathing. Although, yes, you charge someone to teach them how to breathe properly, but not a lot of money. Not like psychotherapy or a stay in the hospital. Far more expensive. So, do the research, find the simple techniques that are proven to work. Breathing through your emotions is one of the most powerful techniques for clearing negativity and getting off the, the endless cycle of pills. We're not making medical advice here. We're legally not allowed to make medical advice. If you want to get off your medications, you do need to work with your doctor, work with someone who's authorized to get you off your medications. Uh, everything he says is for educational purposes only. We're not expecting the Fraud and Death Administration, I mean the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. to come in here and take it away in handcuffs or anything like that. Uh, you probably have your own version of the medical Gestapo here in Iceland. Perhaps you call them under a different name. Next question. Yes. Yeah, my question is about uh, sleeping and dreaming. And, you know, it seems like the only time we kind of step out of the drama of life and I'm wondering where, what the soul is doing while we go into this coma of sleeping. Well, your soul exists on many levels simultaneously and whether it's mental dreaming, which is much more common than astral dreaming, or whether it's astral dreaming, those are levels three and four of your being. So those particular aspects of your being are focusing on a different realm during the sleep state. In other words, you've eliminated a lot of the distractions of the physical body when you are sleeping. And so your mental and astral bodies are free to explore their various realms. You have 
three types of dreams. You have subconscious recycling, which are the most common dreams. This is where you work through daily issues while you're in your sleep, because your subconscious doesn't sleep. It's constantly trying to work through problems and things like that. A good example would be if you're in school and you have an exam the following day, you might have dreams all night about taking your exam. <clears throat> and if you have a fear of not passing the exam, you might have some rather strange dreams. If it's the old-fashioned kind where you, with paper and pencil, you, the, the pencil might be too heavy to lift in the dream, so you're unable to answer the questions. Or maybe you're late getting to the exam room, or, you know, things like that. So those are called subconscious recycling dreams. In this case, the, case, the fear of not passing the exam leads to the dream. Then you have what are called symbolic dreams. An example might be flying dreams. This channel, many, many years ago, used to have recurring dreams where he was trying to get away from people who were chasing him. He kept flying up into the air and then eventually falling back to earth after flying for a while. And there, there they would be trying to catch him again, and he'd have to go again up onto a high building to get away from them or something. And he realized later that this was symbolic of running away from his responsibilities in life. Because he was a bit of a rebel in his early days, and he tried to escape rather than transcend the society. And the dreams were pointing this out to him in a symbolic way, that he had to keep coming back to Earth. And eventually he had to face his attackers, which he sort of did symbolically. So then you have what are called lucid dreams. And lucid dreams are where you become aware that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, and you explore your dream consciously while you're dreaming. And this is the, where you start to get from the mental more into the astral at this point. Astral travel in dreams, uh, his experience <coughs> of the astral is that it, it's a lot like those wax museums. Everything looks kind of waxy and it shimmers and shines in the astral planes. And you can share dreams in the astral. You and a friend can agree to meet somewhere in the astral planes during the dream state. And if you're successful, you can share about it the next day and realize, yes, we, we were both there. I saw you and you saw me um, when you're sharing your dreams the next day. So this can be, be accomplished. It takes practice, of course, like anything else. You set an intention before you go to sleep that you're going to have this type of a dream. And so you could say, well, what is the soul doing? That was the original question. Well, your seventh density, what this channel calls the parent part of your soul, is always in seventh density, no matter what the human self is doing. So that aspect of self remains relatively constant in the higher planes. You have what's called the causal body, which is another level of your soul. This is the part that remembers past lives that creates karmic agreements and contracts. You have the etheric body, which is another aspect of your soul, includes the aura, the chakras, the electromagnetic merid meridians of the body, this sort of thing. And then you have the astral, which during the dream state might be off exploring the astral realms. You have the mental body, which may be exploring the mental realms during the dream state and the emotional body, which might be present in the dream as getting emotional about something going on in the dream. And then you have the physical body, which is usually just resting during the dream state. So the different aspects of your soul are all active on some level. The body is still pumping blood while you're sleeping or you wouldn't wake up. So even your physical body is active when you're dreaming. It's just not as active and your consciousness is not focused on your physical body in the dream state. Those are the main differences. Next question. Yes. Uh, I 
Let's begin. Uh, uh, I was uh, with people who were talking about the, the dimension. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, talking about the dimensions, the, the third dimension, fourth dimension, the fifth dimension. And I was uh, thinking uh, 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 sorry, I, I, uh, my English is not so very good, I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, uh, Take your time and breathe if you need somebody to, to translate, if, if Iceland is your first language. Mm -hmm. uh, on what uh, mention is uh, the hidden people elves? Let us see if we can tune in telepathically to your question. He missed a, a, about half of it. Okay. Uh, third, fourth, and fifth dimensions, uh, and the third, fourth, and fifth densities of the Earth mm -hmm. are related. Um, there's a, a video he did called The Three Parallel Earths, which you might have seen. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that briefly. Mm -hmm. You have three Earths existing simultaneously. Well, actually, it's seven. The three of them are what you call activated. Uh, of course, you have the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom, which are considered first and second density. Then you have the animalistic human, which is third density, the higher human, which is fourth density, the etheric crystal light body is fifth density, the causal body is sixth, and the soul body is seventh. And the earth exists on seven levels simultaneously, although you typically only experience the level that's dominant to your consciousness. Now, in this case, most of you in this room are vibrating at what this channel calls higher fourth density, or the realm of the higher mind. Some of you are frequently in fifth density consciousness, which is the, more the realm of unity and love and compassion. And when you look around the world, you're going to see primarily that which is um, matches your level of vibration, um, like attracts like. Unless you're a teacher or a light worker, which most of you are, in which case you may attract souls who are at a lower vibration in order to teach them. They have chosen you as a teacher, even if it's not a structured teacher-student relationship. It could be a personal relationship where one of you is vibrating at level five and one of you is vibrating at level four. And you have a karmic agreement that the level five member of the relationship is in the teaching role and the level four in the student role. Sometimes you have a relationship where you switch roles periodically. Maybe you're there to teach each other or learn from each other. So there are most of the exceptions to the rule, but generally if you are in fifth density, you tend to attract fifth density souls. If you're in fourth density, you tend to attract fourth density souls. So that's notwithstanding what was said earlier about surrounding yourself with people of a like vibration. If you're in a negative workplace where you're at level four and they're at level three, there may be a karmic contract where they are there to learn from you, you are there to teach them, <clears throat> which doesn't mean that they're going to accept their role as students. They may reject you. So, <clears throat> the three parallel Earths. Third density Earth is in bad shape from a third density point of view. <clears throat> it's a horribly polluted planet. <clears throat> Excuse the channel. The air has been rather dry. Third density is the realm of uh, the animalistic human. Uh, third density humans are primarily concerned with procreation, survival, competition, uh, security, things of this nature. We're not saying that those should not be important to you, but they're not your primary focus in life. So you may quickly attend to the animalistic side of your nature and then focus your consciousness on levels four and five. Level four is the level of individuality, creative thought, um, 
metaphysics, psychic intuitive abilities, imagination, etc. Level five is love, compassion, forgiveness, uh, and it's, it's getting into the etheric realms, which include the elementals, the fairies, the devas, and many other uh, fifth dimensional earthly realities. So there's a concept called activation. Activation is, is the process of imbuing or infusing something with your consciousness. So if you're focused on level five, which she would call ascension, uh, it means that you're activating level five within your being because you're focusing your awareness on level five of your being. Uh, if you're focused on level four, you're activated at level four. All of you in this room are activated at levels three and four, and, and many of you are partially activated at level five. So these three dominant timelines, three dominant realities exist simultaneously in nonlinear time. But in linear time, souls evolve from level three to level four to level five through a linear evolution or what he calls a soul path. The ideal soul path is kind of like a stairway going up like this. So you have periods of, of what are called quantum shifts or quantum leaps where you grow very quickly and then you have a relatively quiet period where you integrate what you've learned and bring it into tangible reality and then you surge forward again and then integrate again. So this is um, linear ascension. But from a nonlinear point of view, you exist simultaneously in all these levels and dimensions. So you can prove scientifically that nonlinear reality exists. He, he, his favorite example are those signs in taverns that say, free beer tomorrow. How much beer do you think they've given away? Because tomorrow never comes. <coughs> Someone please show this channel where tomorrow is. <coughs> it's a concept. When the earth gets to a certain angle with respect to the sun, then he plans to do something. That's the concept of tomorrow. It makes sense in a linear world. The clock says tomorrow at this time, perhaps the workshop is completed for the day and it's time for a meal or something. So, but from a nonlinear point of view, all time is now. There is nothing but now. When you are thinking about the past or the future, when are you thinking about it? Now. It is always now. Five minutes from now, it will be now. See how that works? Linear, nonlinear paradox. It's called a paradox. The only place you can be enlightened, now. It's impossible to be enlightened anywhere but now. And yet many of you think that sometime in the future you're going to attain enlightenment. It's a paradox. In linear time, it looks like your enlightenment may be somewhere in the future. But in reality, in nonlinear reality, you're already enlightened. You simply have to remove the layers of illusion that you have placed on top of your enlightenment. So level five is when you start to transcend the worlds of maya, the worlds of illusion. And you start to come into an understanding that you are a multidimensional being. And you become simultaneously aware of your multidimensional self. So level five is called the ascension. And those who live on the level five world um, have overcome the entropy of the lower four dimensions and their bodies no longer grow sick or die. They, they've taken on the immortal crystal light body. This process is already taking place on the earth. There's 18 human beings who've already attained the light body. And the, we have been instructing this channel for a number of years, that there are going to be between 15 and 30 million human beings who are going to go through ascension. 
in the next 20, 30, 40 years. So that's the level five Earth. The level four Earth is going to be enlightened, self-sufficient, spiritual communities of light, souls coming together to create a beautiful new heavens and new Earth. That's level four, the middle path, uh, where they clean up the environment, they start living sustainably, they end the insanity of war, etc., etc. Level three, you know what level three is about. Just turn on the nightly news and you can hear, learn all about level three. What does the news always begin with? Disasters. Who was killed today in a murder, or who died in a car accident, or who bombed who in a war? That's 99% of the time what the news always starts with. And they call it, if it bleeds, it bleeds. That's their, their expression in the industry. So let's get gore and blood and guts, uh, and we'll get more viewers of our program because they want to... Why do you think crime dramas and horror films are so popular on Earth? People want to feel that adrenaline rush that comes from violence or horror, things like that. Why do you think people do bungee jumping? That's an obvious example or thrill rides at amusement parks. People want to feel their feelings. They've become so deadened to their feelings, they want to feel their feelings. And so they, they, they bungee jump, or they do a roller coaster, or they watch um, crime dramas on television because they want to feel something. They've become deadened by suppressing their feelings over many, many years. And um, we're getting a little bit off the topic of the question. We apologize. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes, there's one here. Uh, okay. um, I have a question about sex. I'm thinking because there's some kind of yoga that forbids sex. Mm -hmm. And is sex keeping you in the first and second density, and is it better to kind of yeah, learn to, to uh, yes. make love in a different way than the mainstream people do, to get higher? Yes, wonderful question. So again, it depends on what level your consciousness is at what sex means to you. If you are at an animalistic third density consciousness, then sex has basically two functions. One is procreation and the other is pleasure. And uh, it's easy to become addicted to pleasure, so many people in third density are addicted to sex. If you're in fourth density, it's, it, it's where you get more creative with sex and you start to recognize that you can go into higher states with sex, that it becomes um, more of an exploratory thing. Let's explore our sexual energy, this sort of thing. And when you come to level five, which would be called the tantric realm of sex, it becomes purely an expression of love. Love is always first, and sex is merely one of the ways of expressing love from the fifth density perspective. There are many who are in fourth density who recognize that and attempt to reach that level with their sexual relationships. Because you have a lot of very deep emotional issues as, as a species, over thousands of years of darkness on this planet, it's very difficult to have absolutely clean and clear sexual relationships. If a sexual relationship is clean and clear, it does not dissipate energy. You actually gain energy from having sex, which you say making love. Well, you're not really making love, but you are uh, expressing love. And if you're expressing it in a, in a whole, complete way, there's no drain of energy. Obviously, if a, if a male has 10 ejaculations in the course of an evening, there's going to be a level of depletion. But emotionally and mentally, there can be sex without depletion. So in your personal sexual relationships, 
If you feel tired and drained after sex, that's an indication that you're not holding the higher frequencies during sex. Doesn't mean you should make yourself wrong or stop having sex necessarily. Chastity and yoga that forbids sex is based on the assumption that the student is vibrating at a low level when, when starting the yoga or starting the spiritual path and is ruled by the animalistic senses, is ruled by attachment to pleasure or addiction to sex or addiction to ego, wanting to be uh, superior over the sexual object or something like that. And so therefore it becomes a distraction on the spiritual path at that level. But as you continue on the sexual path, excuse the channel, as you continue on the sexual path, on the spiritual path, sex starts taking on the higher spiritual attributes. There is a time for celibacy and there is a time for sex. Uh, most students on the spiritual path will go through periods of celibacy either voluntary or seemingly involuntary because they are unable to attract a compatible partner. And then they go through periods where uh, they uh, no longer have an addiction to sex and then it becomes merely an expression of love. And at that point they can either have sex or not and then over time they will be able to be in a high state regardless of whether they're having sex or not. But usually forced abstinence is just like any other form of suppressing emotions. It can create illness in the body, it can hold you back on your, on your spiritual path. So while it may be a necessary transition, especially if you've had a really strong sexual addiction, and you say, you know what, I'm going to join an ashram and I'm going to be celibate for a few years, to help overcome my addiction. I'm going to take away the temptation. There'll be nobody around me as a sexual partner, no opportunity to have sexual partners unless I want to get kicked out of the ashram. Uh, this is assuming that the guru is not exploiting the, the, the students for sex. And then at some point you leave the ashram and you move into having relationships again. In the mystery schools, uh, in many times past, there were stages that the students went through. They might have 10 years of celibacy and then 10 years of being in relationship. And it was, it was different stages. Sorry, this is come loose. Different stages in the process of uh, soul evolution. We'll take one more question. Yeah, you're coming. There are actually two more, but you're not. Uh, I want to ask uh, if it's in, in the terms of densities or levels, are there uh, a positive path and a negative path? Negative being service to self, and if you go to this. Density or levels or negative parts? And yes. Positive parts, service to others. Yes. Indeed, the third and fourth levels, well, let, let's oversimplify it. Level three consciousness is essentially service to self. Level four consciousness can be either or or a combination of service to self and service to others. And fifth density consciousness is pretty exclusively service to others, which includes service to self, because there's no separation in level five consciousness. When you give to another, you're giving to yourself, and when you give to yourself, you're giving to another. There's no separate way of looking at it in level five. In level four, there's still a sense of separation, and there's still the idea that if I do good, maybe I'll win some awards in God's eyes and I'll get promoted up to the next level. So there's still a sense of reward and punishment in level four. <coughs> in level three, because you're totally immersed in separation, you see everything as revolving around the me, myself, and I, or the ego. 
And so there's naturally going to be selfishness and greed and things like that in level three. There might be a false sense of sacrifice in level three, the martyrdom. Uh, you go to church and they convince you that you should be poor because only the poor can enter heaven, which was a misunderstanding of what Jesus taught, by the way. And so therefore, poor people may give the little bit they have to the church in the hopes that God will somehow reward them. But that's still being stuck in third density to a large degree. Maybe they're just starting to get into fourth density at that point, and they recognize that that service is a higher level of expression, but they're not really there yet, and so they have this false sense of pride. Many fourth density souls are stuck in that one as well. Uh, the so-called philanthropists of the world, many of them are giving to avoid paying taxes, or they're giving to look good in the public eye, or because they think that they're somehow better than others because they're giving. And a few of them are giving genuinely from their heart, which is more of a fifth density place. But generally, if you have to try really hard to give, then you're not in fifth density. You're still coming from ego. Uh, the ego is into trying to do things. When you're in fifth density, you're not really trying to be charitable, trying to be loving, trying to be giving. You're just naturally being loving and giving. It just flows naturally through you because you're not concerned with so much with your personal I, little me. So <clears throat> we apologize for those that we did not get to with the questions. Uh, hopefully those of you who have not answered questions will be here to again. And we have a time limit we need to respect. We are the founders. Good evening.